Well, thank you so much for joining the podcast, um, Ganesh. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me, Minaj. There's a lot of material um, that I can talk to you about. You know, you have been very productive in both your writing and your uh, speaking engagements. But I would be really impressed if um, you were also good at painting. The p- picture that you have painted behind you, is it yours or...? <laughs> No, uh, unfortunately, that's not one of the talents I have. So this is uh, this is one I've bought. I really like the scenery. I love nature. So this is something I've I've bought. So no, I don't add that to my list. <laughs> so that's like checked out for from the list that we normally have. But there are a lot of other things that we can talk about. And I know for a fact that you know you both of us actually love nature. That we're going to be talking about that down the line um, in this conversation. But let's kick off with uh, the. Um, Grameener um, service. I mean, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. You, you're normally Gramner. Saying... Gramner. Okay. Where did the name come from? Actually, uh, I'm really curious. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, initially, we started off with a different business plan. So we were uh, looking at energy analytics and uh, rural entrepreneurship. So Grameen Energy. That's how we coined uh, Gramner as a combination of these two words. Eventually, in a year, we pivoted. And uh, from energy analytics, we got into completely data analytics, visualization, storytelling. Um, so the name stuck on uh, and uh, it still kind of creates the curiosity as to what it means. So that way it still works. Could it be the fact that it subconsciously is uh, pivoted from Grameen Foundation from, um, you know, these micro loans? Uh, I think Dr. Yunus got up Nobel Prize for that in Bangladesh. Right. For micro right. loans, um, anything possible? <laughs> uh, so it, it was a little different idea. Uh, we were looking at, uh, uh, say, entrepreneurship, promoting entrepreneurship, and uh, uh, bringing that within the fold of a startup. It was a little ambitious plan, probably a bit way ahead of the time. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it um, a few years down the line. But yeah, no, it has nothing to do with the micro loans. <laughs> okay, good enough. Um, let's talk about. Um, some of your work that um, you've published, uh, which is um, for a lot of people anachronistic, you know, a lot of debates that I um, listen to, a lot of articles that I um, read on Forbes and Wall Street Journal, uh, Bloomberg, um, there's a lot of uh, fluff in that without much substance. The good part of your writing is that, you know, you really get to the point and when you begin an article, you really have an end in the mind. Um, so just put that to in, uh, in a perspective. Let's talk about one of your uh, Forbes articles you wrote about. Um, and you talked about that McKinsey State of AI report in 2020 found that only 22% of organizations reported quantified value from AI. And that's been a ubiquitous problem throughout the uh, industry. Only um, these organizations um, found 5% uh, of the earnings before interest and taxes that could directly be attributed to artificial intelligence. And you wrote a very detailed article about, about how to remedy these situations. So let's just you know um, zoom in into um, what your solutions were. Sure. Uh, like you rightly mentioned, this problem has been there for a number of years. In fact, uh, this has been around for more than 50 years. Uh, this traces back uh, its origins to the time we had the initial wave of AI in the 1950s. Uh, if you recall, there was uh, a lot of excitement around AI back then, 50s, 60s. Uh, the same issue actually led to the AI winter. Organizations were not seeing benefits from their huge AI investment in the 70s and 80s. So 90s onwards, people stopped investing in AI and it was taboo. Now, when we see the similar resurgence of interest, organizations are struggling to demonstrate the return on investment from AI. So the solution really starts with defining the purpose, like you mentioned about the articles, starting with an end in mind. What is the business problem we are trying to solve? And how can you define that as an impact metric? So those are the two uh, points. You Once you're clear that this is... Uh, a pressing business problem aligned with my corporate strategy. And number two, I measure it by using an impact metric, not just a progress metric, for instance, uh, um, efficiency, or uh, in terms of number of uh, transactions done. Instead, if end objective is, say, improving customer experience, or more revenue from my uh, customers, or increase in share of wallet, 
any of these could be the ultimate goal. And we identify an associated impact metric, which we can use to track it. Once we define all of this, then we talk about how technology can come in and address the problem. So far, we have not talked about data or AI, right, in these two steps. Once we are clear on these two things, then we can decide how you can bring in data angle and whether AI is even relevant for this, or should you go with simpler machine learning or even simple uh, descriptive analytics? It is possible that a lot of industry problems can be solved with this, uh, with simpler analytics. So that really is the framework which I talk about in the article. Start with the outcome, define your impact metrics. And third thing is uh, you'll have to find out whether the outcome, whatever you're getting three months down the line is really cost for your project. Because there are a lot of market shifts happening. Uh, one of the examples I mentioned is uh, there's a explosion of uh, subscribers in the OTT platforms around the world, Disney Plus, Netflix, and so on. Uh, so it's it's no coincidence that this happened uh, around COVID at the, at the time of quarantining and social distancing. So you'll have to isolate some of these factors and say, okay, it's caused by some of these other external factors, not just because of a marketing strategies. So how do you attribute the impact of your analytics initiatives and find out uh, what is really the outcome driven by your project? And finally, continuing to track this and look at the costs and benefits a lot of hidden costs are not very obvious costs are there when, when it comes to data science, uh, subscription cost, your computing, and a lot of these things which can scale up over time. So how do you identify all of these costs, benefits, put them together and come up with an ROI? So that really is a framework on how you get started, how you come to this uh, finishing point, and after that, keep doing it uh, cyclically right? because it's, it's a never-ending process. And I think it's a very good point that you broached, um, and I've been talking to um, senior data leaders. Um, Doug Laney was on my show, um, who's written yeah. the um, famous book, Infonomics. And this seems to be a perennial problem that um, gaining C-suite buy-in uh, when it comes to um, establishing data costs and data profits. Um, it's a huge problem. No one knows um, how to do that, but you know it still needs to be done. And we have gone to great lengths talking about how to establish if it, the data initiative is worth um, adapting. So one of the ways, we, and you also talked about that in your articles, is to establish a baseline. Uh, this is our cost, and this is where we want to get, and is artificial intelligence initiative going to get us there cheaper? And one of the baseline that you established, um, or at least suggested in your articles, is, about, is the human baseline. So that's what we're doing right now. Um, and that's what humans do. If we put in AI, how much the cost would go down and what would be the additional benefit of that? So expand a little bit on that idea because I find it very um, creative um, to find out some kind of mutual um, point from where we could actually you know, run the basis. Yeah, uh, establishing the baseline is a very important point. Uh, when you talk about, you're going to get uh, these kind of productivity improvements or even when you talk about recommending, uh, say, a, a product to a customer, what is how likely uh, is that recommendation to be relevant to a customer? So you'll have to find out the accuracy aspects. Uh, when you talk about accuracy improvements and all of it, there has to be a baseline. Uh, the, my pet peeve is when you run machine learning projects and numerous engagements we have seen, and this is what I hear from industry leaders as well, that often people pick on accuracy numbers of models. They say, okay, your model is 85% accurate. Why can't it be 95 or 99% accurate or even 100% accurate? So that becomes a point of debate. That's where when you establish a baseline, you can answer those questions. When you go back and measure what is the current rate when humans are doing it, you might be surprised that most of these processes, um, we might be running at say 75 to 80%. We've actually measured uh, whether it is classifying certain text comments from customers into different buckets of the journey steps, or uh, whether it is, say, classifying images uh, manually. So many of these, the human accuracy rate today would be about 70 to 80% or so. And there, when you establish that as a baseline, a model which is giving you 81% or even 79% is already doing quite well, comparable. Then you can talk about what are the future improvements and all of it. So establishing baseline actually puts a puts the model in the right context and uh, brings uh, actually makes the uh, expectations more realistic.
I think it's a very good segue into um, another article that you wrote about Forbes, which I absolutely like, and I think I've shared it with a lot of people. Um, and it's very hard to explain that to um, the decision makers in an organization. And I'm sure that you have worked with a lot of people around the world um, in different organizations as consultant um, at Gramner, and it's a very hard sell, um, even though the idea is very simple. So you talk about um, the infamous case of Netflix um, organizing it a tournament sort of um, to uh, give multi-million dollar prize to um, a team that would boost its recommendation engine, um, the accuracy of the recommendation engine to 10%. And what ended up happening after three years of this um, ongoing competition is that only one team could barely make uh, that um, cut above 10%. And by that time, the business model had changed. Um, by that time, you know, the priorities had totally changed. And the model itself was so complicated that they dumped the model, they never put it into production. Right. And what they did was that they used the second best model, which is 8%, but fairly simple. And um, I don't want to go to technical terms, but you know, a lot of academic um, researchers that I've had on the podcast, we talked about the model parsimony, which is in some cases more important than the model being accurate. Um, and I think the ingenuous um, idea um, that you talk about um, in that article is the fact that um, sometimes accuracy is not as important as the business objectives. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that. You know, how did you come um, with that idea? In fact, that article is a little provocatively titled, uh, your AI model is wrong, yet it can deliver tremendous business value. <laughs> uh, so uh, that comes from the years of uh, talking to business stakeholders and convincing them that uh, this is actually really good for you and it can give you great returns. Uh, the example, Netflix is a very popular one and uh, people are uh, familiar with the Netflix recommendation model. So that, that is a great example to open. Like you rightly mentioned, um, eventually the model cost and the cost of maintenance, uh, engineering cost is very important. Organizations, uh, when they move a model from pilot to production, they miss noting those total costs of ownership, which they'll have to sustain over a period of time. So if you have a very complex model, you will need either a heavy infrastructure to maintain it, or you will need a highly skilled team to continuously uh, tinker and tweak it. So those are prohib prohibitive costs. So that's where uh, a good balance between a good enough model, which has low to moderate costs of maintenance versus a great model, which is completely unmanageable. Uh, you'll have to make the trade off and naturally you'll shift towards the former one. Uh, there are several examples I share in the article um, in terms of how you can make that uh, convincing case. It's one thing to say that we need to go with uh, this kind of a model, which is uh, low cost, but then the business teams will have a question, why should I adopt it? If I have something at 85%, even like two, three, two to 3% higher efficiency, uh, why can't I take that? So that's where I uh, have presented four cases that you can use to convince the teams. One of those we spoke about is even benchmarking, ex establishing where is the human baseline. And second, uh, and another important point, which often people miss is models have a steep learning curve. For example, the, the you might be familiar with the protein folding challenge, uh, which recently, I think a couple of years back, there was some major uh, splash in the news about alpha fold, uh, breaking some of the earlier uh, accuracy numbers, which most, most models have. And last year, uh, it effectively solved the protein folding problem, which has been a 50 year old challenge, uh, which humans haven't been able to crack. This AI model, uh, alpha fold, has actually pretty much uh, solved it by increasing the accuracy to I think about 95% or so. And just two years back, it was uh, more than 10 percentage points lower. So you can imagine in two years, 10 percentage points, and particularly it was those higher 90 levels is uh, almost impossible in many cases. So AI and particularly machine learning models have very steep learning curves. So even if your accuracy today is low, if you keep uh, feeding it with new data, good uh, feedback, it can really learn really rapidly. So those are some of the cases which you can use to educate. And in fact, uh, one of the points is though we talk about this misconception, ultimately as uh, practitioners in the data world, we need to play the role of educating the audience uh, and they don't understand it because they don't uh, have that background. So we need to play that role of uh, 
explaining how a model works and why a model, like there's a famous uh, uh, quote that all models are wrong, right? So why all models are wrong? How does it work? And wh why you should trust a model? So all of those things, once you explain and uh, do those comparisons, there is greater adoption and acceptance by the business users. And I think that is a role of all practitioners. I think one of the reasons um, a lot of AI adoption becomes um, an issue for um, senior management is the lack of clear beyonds of what things can be um, in comparison to what they are now. For example, Google Cloud has been in the loss uh, for many years, um, but you know, still put started to put money in that and believe in the product. And I think this is the, probably the first year that they've become um, and profitable. And one of the things um, from a technical perspective is the staleness that comes with the data itself by the nature of the data. So there are two concepts. One is the data drift and the model drift. So the users that are hitting your website, they're not always going to be coming from the same demo, uh, demography or, you know, in the same time. So, you know, the distribution will always change. And that's something that's too hard for the non-technical senior management to understand that, you know, the, the change is a continuous um, pattern um, in the life cycle of organizations. Sometimes your view of how this traffic um, should be treated will change. Sometimes the data itself will change. And, you know, it, in that regard, for, for, from an outsider perspective, it looks like a moving target. So how do you sell a moving target uh, to an audience that doesn't like change? Broadly, if you look, if you talk about uh, data analytics, it is probabilistic in nature. Or there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and uh, even try, uh, start, uh, start with the project planning and even timelines. It is a moving target. You can't tell with uh, certainty that you will complete the model building on this date, or it will have this accuracy, or even whether it will completely solve a problem. You don't know that upfront. Uh, so you will have to take a leap of faith, uh, which is also a reason why we, um, we also mentioned you start with a simpler analysis. You, when you do the descriptive exploratory analysis, you, you get to uh, understand what are the potential efficiencies, what are the benefits possible. And when you identify those descriptive insights, you can already tell users, uh, for instance, if you, let, let's take an example. You're, um, you're looking at um, customers and which customers to uh, sell a particular ad slot to for a media company who's trying to fill their ad slots uh, for their national television. Uh, they're trying to decide which customers will most likely buy a particular ad slot. So a, a typical recommendation problem. So before you can decide whether uh, a good model can identify the, the most likely customer, if you start finding out uh, which kind of customers have bought these shows, uh, ads in these shows in the past? Uh, simple backward focused descriptive analysis. And you start finding out that, okay, these have been the FMCG companies who have typically bought. And these kind of uh, target segments are being served. Uh, and what kind of ads are popular? So you start uh, sketching the picture and, and finding out what all is likely to work. That is backward focus. That's not a prediction, but that is useful. And when you share those insights with uh, business teams and say, this is what has been working out well for you, that is useful for them. And at the next step, if uh, when you build the model and if it is able to come up with good accuracies and it is ma making a good enough recommendation, then that becomes easy to implement. So even if you don't have a model which is ready uh, and it meets the cut today, those initial insights which you identify and shared, which will be, they will be useful for, uh, making some manual decisions. So the answer to your question is, it is a shifting goalpost, but if you take it step by step and ensure that you're trying to solve the problem, even if not completely, but directionally you're moving in that, uh, in that path, that can give a useful nuggets of information from, from data for the business users to act and make some decisions. Over time, you can improve the model and make sure that it exactly meets the need. One of the reasons I really like about your work um, is the fact that you don't only uh, explain it to users um, how the things work, you also tell them how to use certain tools that you have created and Grammar has created 
so that they can find themselves where they are in the whole cycle. So one of the tools that you have on your website is called um, the data maturity assessment for organizations. So by filling out some of the questions, they would find out uh, where do they actually stack up with others and what stage they are and what should we do to get to the next level. So tell us a little about uh, digital, uh, I'm sorry, data maturity assessment tool that you have. What we've been hearing from leaders is uh, they are trying to uh, increase the use of data for their decision making, particularly in the last few years uh, with things going digital, there's a greater demand for analytics. So the, the question from leaders and particularly chief data officers is, uh, how should we go about creating this roadmap? Where should we invest? What are those most impactful projects? While you can identify some low hanging fruits and say, okay, these are the three, four transactional projects you can pick up, that is not useful in the longer run. You will have to really identify what are those uh, ways that data can enable your corporate strategy and how analytics can influence and help you achieve your business goals uh, sooner and better. So when we talk about building that roadmap and achieving the strategic alignment, the starting point is assessment of where you are. Like you mentioned earlier, benchmarking. In this case, again, if you want to benchmark and find out where you are in your journey, uh, you will have to start with uh, some way to assess what are your tools, uh, processes, and people capabilities. And then that becomes a, a starting point to establish those gaps which are those areas you need to immediately focus on? Which are those long-term things you can worry about, say, next year or two years later? So the assessment, uh, data maturity assessment is a tool which we've built, which goes through all of these aspects, uh, the complete 360-degree aspect of uh, what is needed for success with data. And uh, it identifies all of those strengths, weaknesses, and prepares a customized report. It for Number one, it ranks where you are in the maturity on a five scale level, uh, which is what Gartner has been um, uh, advocating and they've published the five stage maturity model. We identify where an organization falls on a similar five stage maturity model. And at the next level, what are the different dimensions? For instance, how good is your vision with data? Uh, how good is your execution? And what are some people capabilities you need to build? So there are different aspects of uh, vision, execution, ongoing monitoring, and, and uh, connection with the business users and so on. So across all of these aspects, we identify the strengths, weaknesses, and that becomes as an input to identify the users and create a roadmap. Uh, a free version of this we have put out uh, in the, um, like on our website, uh, you can share the link. That's a, a smaller version, but that also gives a good enough starting point to find out where they are. And then we combine that with our workshops to chart out a custom roadmap for, for organizations. So that's how data maturity is an important starting point for all data leaders to uh, use to benchmark where they are in the journey. I mean, um, business leaders uh, in general, they're very good at giving out um, advice to other people and seldom good at taking it themselves. And uh, one of the things that uh, I mentioned that in your um, writings, um, I was going through your Medium um, blog um, post and I found out that um, you're probably re re religiously good at um, noting down your own data points in your life. Um, so the word has it for the past four years, you have had at least 120,000 data points uh, about your own life and you're logging your life every 15 minutes. It's quite a gargantuan task for um, a normal person. Um, I We do a lot of uh, work, behavioral pipelines and um, you know behavioral prediction um, at CIDA. Um, we've gotten a lot of rap for that, but you know one of the biggest problem is to get the, those data points from people. And I think you would make it such a wonderful, happy client of us because you know you have all the data points um, that I would ever need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talking about eating your own dog food, right? Uh, so we recommend data-driven decision-making. Uh, and in fact, this started uh, as uh, an experiment four years back that I was trying to see how I can channelize my energy. And I was also curious, where is my time really going? All of us have this question. A good productive week, but at the end of it, we, we, we wonder where did we really spend all of the time? So it started out like that. And then uh, I started filling in a, uh, my own time log. And uh, initially, it was just only within the work hours. Then I thought, why don't we extend it to beyond work, the time I spend with the family, the time I spend reading, and so on. Uh, 
so i settled on this 15 minute uh, granularity the interval and uh, i started capturing it first couple of months it was uh, it was drudgery like you mentioned it is a, a gargantuan task but what uh, insights i started finding out actually gave me a lot of motivation to go on and i, I still do it i do it very religiously uh, so it can be a useful tool to build habits the way at least one strong takeaway i have from this exercises it has helped me uh, get more conscious of where i'm spending my time and it has helped me build some very strong habits which four years back i was not even um, very serious about so that's how a personal data collection project can also help you make personal decisions and build very strong habits which can take you far I think that partially explains the productivity that you have been able to, you know, dish out with all their articles and um, Forbes uh, opinions and um, your TED talk and everything else. And we're going to be talking about that um, soon. But let's get to your um, product, um, Gramex. And um, it's such a delight to see the shift from um, siloed solutions from back end to front end to different open source tools. Um, to business architecture tools, uh, infrastructure tools, different cloud uh, migrations, and that you know always um, you know sends people spinning on what to do and what not to do. And I think uh, technical people, engineers, uh, are probably um, the greatest beneficiary of that. Um, but what Gramex does is that you know it it um, very nicely puts everything together in one pack solution, which is easy to understand. Uh, I mean, if you look at the website, if you look at the presentation, how the products work, it's very, it gives people the end-to-end -end solution with peace of mind instead of, you know, worrying about the technology itself. So what I've noticed is that the genius in, in Gramex is the architecture that it builds upon. Um, it doesn't require people to change their tech stack to integrate it with Gramex, and you can build up on top of what you already have without breaking your existing infrastructure. So who came up with the idea and how did you actually manage to you know, take uh, it from the data uh, to the machine learning and data science um, aspect um, to the results and reports for business decision makers and on top of that visualization? Yeah, that's a great summary of uh, the positioning and uh, the kind of problem you're solving in the industry. If I talk about the origins of this and uh, how we came up with this idea, 10 years back when we started, uh, what we noticed uh, was one, a lot of data, but it was disconnected from decision making. And when we uh, digged in a little deeper, we found out the reason for the disconnect, which was uh, a lot of uh, off the shelf products, which solved some ready made problems, but no two organizations have the same kind of challenges. And most of the tools in the market, they didn't have the flexibility uh, to, uh, to, to be customized for a specific need. And to be fair, it is very difficult to build a standard product which can meet all of those varied needs. So that is where we move towards a platform as opposed to a product approach, a platform which is uh, flexible, the best of both worlds. One, it, it is flexible. And at the same time, it comes with some pre-built components a library of uh, different routines, both analytics and visual routines, which you can quickly stitch together and assemble an application. And uh, that becomes a working solution for your business users. So uh, it's a low code platform. Many users for standard needs, you, you won't have to code. When you want to really get in and tweak things uh, uh, under the hood, you have the option to write code and tweak it as well. So that looked like a good balance. We tested out the market uh, with, uh, with, with some of the clients. And then we, uh, we found that there was a great resonance in the market for this kind of an approach. Uh, over time, we've been adding uh, different machine learning solutions and, and newer components in data visualization, storytelling, narrative aspects. So a lot of capabilities we've been bundling into it. So it started off with that problem of uh, standard tools not meeting that the, the custom needs. And at the same time, organizations need rapid time to market. They don't have time to take three to six months to build an application. So Gramex actually falls right in between and solves those challenges. I think um, your, your game plan seems to be like to provide people platforms that they focus on um, going to market faster instead of you know working with um, the tech problems. Uh, one of the AI leaders, Greg Cookie from Amazon, was on my show um, earlier, and we talked about the fact that Amazon uh, probably doesn't f uh, fear the competition as much because whatever product they're going to make, um, they need they'll need a cloud to put that on, 
And in the end, you know, uh, they were probably um, taking the um, food chain from the beginning. And that's what Apple does with the hardware and the OS and everything else. Um, and I think uh, briefly, if you would mention, have you seen the recent spat between Facebook and uh, Amazon? I'm sorry, Apple, uh, about um, the privacy and everything else. And, and it seems always like the winner becomes um, the the company or um, the service that has the platform. And what does the game plan look like for Gramner? Is it always going to be the platform? Because it seems like, you know, um, I don't know how sophisticated and deep the roots go, but it seems like, you know, if a big tech wanted to tread in your territory, um, it would, wouldn't take that much time to do that. Um, so how do you differentiate yourself from uh, that market? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and there are many companies who have built their own machine learning platforms. And when you talk about uh, uh, popular ML platforms, all of the big companies, they have their own. Uh, the real differentiation and how we compete in the market is uh, ours is more or less like a, uh, we take the Lego blocks approach. There are different tools. We are not uh, looking at replacing or building out the entire ecosystem of tools. Instead, there are certain things we do well. For instance, the custom uh, solutions for specific business needs. How do we uh, quickly assemble applications in a matter of days? And for that, uh, a lot of organizations have already invested in uh, whether it is visualization tools like Power BI, Tableau, or machine learning tools like, say, AWS or Azure. We act as an integrator, which stitches multiple things together and builds a custom application by integrating with these different tools. If, an, For example, if an organization already uh, uses Power BI and many of our customers do. So in that case, we bring in the layer uh, which they don't have, which is the, the deep analytics connection to the data and all of those. Uh, and then we, we integrate with Power BI. And there are other customers who don't have a visual front end. They have some, say they have been using R or SAS in the back, back end. So we take uh, inputs from those models, which already they have built. We don't have to uh, redo them. And then we have those rich interactive visual layers, which, uh, which take the data from these existing models. And then they, they present the results in a new way. So that way, uh, the storytelling is uh, taken care of in the second, in the second case. So that way, this is, uh, kind of an aggregator across and, and connector across different platforms. And it helps to quickly assemble those uh, custom business solutions. So that, that's how we work and we have deep partnerships. For instance, Microsoft is a very strong partner. Um, so we work with uh, uh, them across the, uh, the board for their different classes of tools. So that's how we found that, that niche that we fit into. And apart from the platform, another area where customers come to us is that the advisory aspect. Yes, we have these tools, but how do we use them? How do we identify those projects? Like we spoke about, about the roadmap, uh, which uh, categories or business areas are ripe candidates for applying analytics? Uh, and how do I improve my adoption? How do I convince my users? So we bring in both of those aspects, which uh, becomes a good complementary skill. I think one of the greatest um, selling points with you is that uh, we also are Microsoft Silver. Uh, partners um, in Pakistan, and one of the things um, about them is that you know they really encourage um, innovation and partnership. For example, if you have a customer who has their data on Azure, you can simply be build the Gramex platform on top of that, and you can give them the business solutions. And I think one of the niche areas uh, that you're working on, um, and which is probably the most uh, important winning point for you, is the business um, insights and experience that you bring um, to the whole. Uh, flow of um, the product I'm making for any companies. So example, think of um, it from a client perspective, so they can put their um, web app out for three, in, in three, four days, instead of three, four months, building on your platform, all that data is already on the Azure. Um, then you're building um, the real-time business insights. Um, I think there's very little to be desired after all of these things are um, aligned in a record time to go to the market. Um, let's talk about the, the specific um, granular uh, modules that you have uh, in your product. Um, for example, one of the things that I really liked about um, is the generating real-time business um, insights with the data changing and the distribution changing for different parameters. Um, and you seem to handle um, this um, quick rendering of information through something called model handler. Let's talk about that. Yeah, uh, there are some very critical components the, behind the scenes. Data handler is one of those, model handler is another. Uh, 
the approach we've taken with all of these components is we have that, uh, for example, a client has the data and um, any data has to be transformed and uh, brought into a form that you can then apply analytics on. So whether it is in, in Excel terms, if you think of pivot tables, you're creating those quick summaries and then that becomes a base for insight. So similarly, when you have uh, gigabytes of data coming from 10 different sources, before you can pass it to your model, it has to be aggregated and massaged in a certain way. So that, that's what some of these components, like for example, data handler does that. And model handler aggregates uh, the data and then it uh, pulls in the relevant set of models that you need. Uh, this is this again takes the same approach I mentioned earlier, which is aggregation across different mo model libraries available. Uh, for example, R has a lot of great models. So we don't go back and uh, code again, say a regression or a SPM, any of these algorithms, so which is already available. The model handler integrates with these, and then it is able to take the data, which is transformed, pick up the model, stitch both together, in the engineering, there are some, some parameterized ways to tune the model and engineer the model. And then the output is then fed back to the uh, storytelling layer. So the model handler makes this process, the model engineering handling all of it very seamless and simple. And this can tap into either our own library of models, which is for very specific cases where we didn't find a good fit uh, or with some business wrappers, we have built some models. Whereas uh, whatever is, plain vanilla standard available. Uh, for example, if you take deep learning, computer vision, many of those are standard and are already available. The model handler can, can connect to those and then uh, stitch the data and then uh, give the needed output. So that is the approach we have taken with model handler. You know, this um, relationship building um, with so many tools is probably the um, great idea with the product itself. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, how it generates the business value for and the leaders and decision makers um, through a component that you called the story narration for data, um, which is the user story, um, or you could call it um, the data stories. And one of the great uh, things about it is that it's been used in one of the most data intensive and most global organizations in the world. So you recently worked with um, World Bank Innovation and um, Technology Report and uh, Entrepreneurship Report, and, and the visualization was like really breathtaking. It gives all the information that you probably need uh, to make um, the information more classified in your brain um, from a cognitive point of view. Um, and in that report, you have different variables that you can change in real time based on the filter that you select uh, to be uh, to be displayed. Um, and if you have data that is um, petabyte size, uh, that's probably not the easiest thing to do. And that's what um, inspires me a lot about, um, you know, thinking of uh, the, the furnishing time of visualization um, in, in a way that it, it's faster. Let's talk a little bit about how did you, um, you know, collaborate with World Bank uh, to get this data and then visualize it and what was um, the goal behind um, your, um, you know, what was in, in your mind? Sure. Uh, World Bank, uh, this partnership was on uh, the innovation data. There, were, there was data about uh, different countries uh, around the world. Um, what, is the, what are the uh, infrastructural state of these countries? Uh, and they, had, they have several indices, like the uh, innovation index and infrastructure index and other regulatory constraints which companies have uh, when they are, say, creating startups in these countries. So they had a lot of rich data covering different aspects, uh, education levels, availability of funding and so on. Uh, and World Bank encourages people to download the data and uh, play, play with them and then share the analysis. So in addition to promote that, they also put out some uh, simple summaries. When we started discussing with World Bank, uh, we said we can actually make this a lot more appealing and excite the users by using rich storytelling. And that's how this uh, the idea led to creation of a platform. And it had two objectives. One was the data which is already available and which they are sharing as simple Excel tables for download by the users. How do we make it exciting and bring out some very key insights which people can immediately consume? Just like say going to New York Times and reading an article. Can you make it that appealing? Uh, that's number one. The second objective was don't stop at that because then people would just read, close the browser and move on. So how do you promote the users to play with the data 
and find their own insights, the exploratory stuff. So you need to provide an, an interface for that. So with these two challenges, what we did was we took up the data and we uh, went through the standard exploratory analysis and uh, the modeling process to find out what was this, uh, what were the juicy insights. Uh, and we found a number of them. And after identifying those insights, for instance, there were some um, outliers that, uh, for example, there were some developing countries um, which actually were in the league of these uh, the, the, the developed countries in, say, uh, North America and Europe. Uh, and there were similarly outliers from these developed countries which were not doing good from certain aspects of innovation. So uh, we identified those insights and then we created a storytelling layer uh, very similar to what you would find on, um, say, the, the data journalism site, the New York Times example I mentioned, where you uh, keep clicking on uh, next, 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 and then you st start reading uh, those headline summaries with attractive visuals, almost like an interactive infographic. So we had uh, those three, four layers of insights with rich visuals and with all the animation. And that uh, satiated the, uh, the need to, uh, for a user to consume and find something new. And in the last screen, what we provided was, okay, you've seen all of these. Now we provide you those access and we give you an interface where you can choose uh, any of those, no, any of this underlying data, and you can find out your own patterns and form your own relationships. For instance, I choose. Uh, uh, imagine there is this bubble plot, a uh, scatter plot with different bubbles. Uh, you can choose what you want to see on the x-axis. To, for example, if you want to see how availability of infrastructure impacts innovation in a particular country, or I want to look at how education levels impact uh, uh, impact innovation and entrepreneurship. I can choose some of these parameters. There are hundreds of, uh, uh, like hundred, hundreds of metrics to choose from. And then you start finding out your own patterns. We have uh, uh, vetted the appetite of the users and then provided an interface for them to play around with. So this was a big success story. Uh, there was great response to this, uh, uh, to this visual property. And, uh, so, uh, so this led to a lot of other such initiatives where uh, we took up, uh, for instance, there was this um, another uh, data set uh, from, from World Bank, which every year we've been doing. Um, uh, I can probably share that link as well. Uh, we found this model to be very relevant and engaging for the users. Yeah, I think the only precedent that I have, um, and I do test a lot of new tools um, with data science and artificial intelligence as soon as they're out, I mean, I think the only precedent that has, um, you know, some kind of similarity with um, this model is um, our studios, our markdown, and where you could actually, you know, create a report and you know, insert the variables from the data set and then you know, publish it on the um, Shiny app and it would show as if it's a report and then you can, you know, create different um, triggers like uh, monthly or daily and, you know, these reports will be sent um, to the decision makers on a schedule. And there's no other tool that does that. Um, and I think, it's a very um, informative tool for at least journalists. For example, one of the newspapers that does it so well is Guardian. You know, they have a lot of yep. visual um, aspect of um, how the stories are depicted, you know, how ca catastrophes and earthquakes are uh, visualized. Um, and I think that they're doing a fantastic job and data science is becoming more and more popular in the journalism sector. But I noticed the fact that, you know, that's not something new uh, for Grammar. They have been doing it for a long, long time, even though people think that that's a relatively new uh, company that's coming up uh, with the new ideas. So when I was researching for the interview, I stumbled upon um, a really, really old uh, presentation uh, that you and Anand did for in 2012 okay. um, on a platform called Fifth Elef Elephant Conference right, yeah. about big data. Um, and then you you talked about visualizing the, one of the epic sagas from um, Hindu mythology, <laughs> Mahabharata. Um, and I found it very interesting. You know, that's very relevant to a lot of audience that you were talking to. And, and that creates um, a spirit. You know, people are taking interest um, in that, which I found a, a very good way to create awareness and build, um, you know, uh, awareness about the the topic that you're talking about. Let's uh, t t talk about that um, conference in particular and, you know, it, it, and and what I'm trying to um, expre explain here is the fact that you have always been interested in, um, you know, the idea of visualization. Um, yeah. That's not something new for Grammar, is it? Right. That That's right. You're, you're spot on. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those early years and the experiments we have done. 
Uh, on your earlier point, uh, you mentioned about Guardian. That's a uh, this is a great mention, Guardian. And there's a lot of great da data journalism happening today. And one other example I wanted to mention in this context, which was an inspiration for us as well, was uh, Gapminder. Hans Rosling's Gapminder. Uh, I think most people. Oh, have, Hans uh, Rosling is hands video. down one of the most, uh, great, right. and you know, he's wonderful statistician. And I kind of uh, regret that I've never met him when I was studying in Sweden. Um, would have been a good. Oh, okay, pleasure. you were in Sweden. Okay. Yeah, uh, he, he's a great person. He's an inspiration for so many of us. Um, and his video, I think he also had a TED talk on that, uh, which is 100 years, 100 countries. Uh, so that was a fascinating one. And that is more on the lines of what we were trying to emulate uh, with World Bank. So that is another precedent. And, um, and that's uh, very popular as well. Uh, now, switching back to this, uh, the, the text and this conference. So early days uh, of Gramner, uh, visualization is one of the ideas we started off with. I talked about disconnect between data and decision making, uh, while custom solutions and a low code platform has been the approach. The last mile of delivery, we've always believed till today uh, that uh, visualization and storytelling is that layer which will uh, enable decision making. You can have the best of model insights, but if you don't communicate it in a way that end users can understand, not just understand, but also act upon then it doesn't serve the purpose. So early days of Gramner in 2011-12, we took up a lot of public data. And that time uh, we were still uh, acquiring a lot of new clients and uh, we were in the early stage of our journey. So we were trying to create awareness in the market. So, so that's where uh, we did this work on uh, uh, visualizing the Mahabharata, uh, the Indian epic. Uh, and this till date is one of the most visited pages for the last 10 years. And similarly, we had also done um, fun visualizations on Shakespeare's sonnets and, and so many other public, like popular, um, uh, popular literature. So this one, uh, we can talk, if this is of interest, we can talk a little bit more about the, the insights or we can talk about um, how um, we had done it in some other examples as well. Hey, your gallery is actually full of such examples. And um, I think the only precedent that I know from um, the um, visualization of data is from the Kaggle. And you know, after that, there there's in one place, I think, think Gramex probably takes it uh, away with that. Um, how did you actually come up with the idea? Whose idea was that, by the way? Gramex, uh, the brainchild, it was a brainchild of um, Anand. Uh, no, studio. I was talking about the visualization part. Yeah, the visualization uh, initially also, uh, this, is, this is something which was uh, Anand's idea that this is the way to solve it. So he brought up different, um, uh, like taking simple corporate reports. He used to recreate them and show what is the power that you can unleash when you present information in a different way. Uh, and uh, visualization, so that way, that was one of the strong selling points for Gramner and uh, when we were sharing this with the prospects before even acquiring our first client uh, when we showed it to people it uh, uh, people resonated to that and in fact our very first client airtel uh, when we won the client this happened within a week uh, so we showed it to the ceo and uh, some of these the examples which anand had created and uh, the ceo his eyes really lit up he said wow this is this is something i've never seen reports like this uh, and then he said how can we engage you guys we said, okay, why don't you give us um, your data and we will show what is possible with that. And uh, the, the standard technology team response was, uh, we have all of the tools in IBM and um, Airtel was one of the biggest IBM shops uh, at that time in India. Uh, and they had a, a transformational deal signed as well. So they said, we have all of the enterprise B, BI, BO tools. So why do we need a startup? So we said, okay, why don't you give us uh, your data set from marketing team or whatever area you choose, which you can easily share. And we will tell you something which your team may not be aware of in a week. And if you're convinced, then let's talk next steps. So that way they shared uh, the marketing data this is for prepaid telecom customers. And in a matter of three days, we identified some very strong insights, uh, created a, a quick uh, storytelling visualization out of it. And we went back and presented uh, to the CEO and uh, his, his next level. And at the end of the meeting, we got the project. So this was a, a great success story, thanks to visualization and this different way of thinking. 
Well, innovation always comes with um, a great team, and um, it's kind of funny story that uh, we and Prashant, I mean, Prashant and I was talking on my podcast. He is the vice president of H two O um, for the life um, for the life and health sciences, and we were um, joking about the fact that. Um, you know, IITs in India and IIMs in India, um, you know, they're one of the best universities um, you can find great talents in. And, uh, but at the same time, these universities are known to kill last remnants of happiness and humor in people. And uh, they're <laughs> very competitive. And how's that to, uh, how's that working? I mean, what's the culture like in Gramner? How's that to work with these IIT and IIM geeks like um, Mayank, Anand, Naveen, Ravi, um, and Venkatesh. I mean, it, it, it sounds like a very boring place unless it really <laughs> has changed. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, in fact, if you're talking about the hair, hairstyle change, so if you look back at uh, uh, the last 10 years, there's been a lot of changes. I noticed and, you had um, a lot of hair in that um, <laughs> elephant con conference. <laughs> Right, yeah. So with uh, the increase in data insights, I've been losing my hair. <laughs> so, uh, and I think about five years back, I went clean shaven. <laughs> uh, now, uh, talking about the team, so we, uh, I think a little bit, little bit unusual uh, for a startup. We have uh, six co-founders, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this is one of the first questions people. Uh, Back then, when we were talking about uh, our journey and the early days, uh, they used to ask about, okay, are you self-funded? Is it a stable startup? And how many founders and all? So always the question was around, okay, how do you manage with six co-founders? <laughs> so uh, thankfully for us, uh, most of us had worked for many years before coming together at Gramna. So um, for example, with Naveen, now I've been working for almost 15 years now. So before Gramner, about five to six years I had worked with him. And similarly, may, uh, many of them had joined together, like Naveen, Anand, all of them joined together as entry-level trainees uh, in their first job. So that way, uh, there's a strong bonding among this team. And there was a camaraderie and, and sense of understanding. And we also brought in complementary skills. Uh, all of us come from a technology background, but different aspects of it. For instance, Venkatesh brings in a strong financial and he has been a serial entrepreneur. So that way all of us bring in complementary skills and there is a trust and uh, a comfort in um, in what we do. So that way- Is, that happiness, is, very... and is happiness and humor one of those uh, components that they bring to the company? Happiness, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Happiness is, is definitely key because uh, there are conscious decisions we have taken along the journey um, that uh, we want to, stay true to our values and we want to enjoy what we are doing so there are uh, like each of us are uh, fascinated for instance i'm very passionate about learning uh, and trying out new things i'm very uh, experimenting it so that way uh, we've taken different roles in the organization at different points also one looking at the company what the organization needs but also second uh, to keep ourselves motivated and happy at what we are doing so that flexibility and comfort has been there. Um, so there are uh, decisions we have taken, which maybe in, in, in uh, uh, normal organizations, it, it might have say, uh, increased the growth rate a little bit, but it would have come with a huge compromise. So we've not gone with those. Uh, so happiness, yes. And humor, uh, yes, I, we have a lot of, uh, we play a lot of practical jokes. Uh, in fact, uh, today morning, uh, we just had a, a connect, uh, incidentally, two hours back, we had a connect, we had an interim board meeting. Uh, so there, uh, uh, in fact, Anand was pulling off a prank. He had a video recording uh, of himself. He was not live on the uh, in the call. So uh, for a few minutes, none of us realized. He was just sitting and nodding. And and, and then some, some, suddenly uh, we noticed something was odd. Then we realized he was pulling out a prank. He had a video recording going on. He was not live. So then he came on the video. And uh, you might have seen some of those, the, uh, the Zoom pranks. So he was playing one of that. So, so that kind of practical jokes uh, at times we do. So uh, data analytics, we are not that boring geeks. <laughs> I think the movie Three Idiots have portrayed engineers in a very bad light. And some way it's like either you get into a Ivy League university or it's a suicide mission. Um, and I was just wondering, um, you certainly um, as a leader in analytics and someone who has traveled the world, um, have probably developed opinions and um, ideas and suggestions um, for the education system in general. I mean, when you look in um, at the 
education in engineering or um, STEM fields or in general um, in India? What do you think has improved since your time? And what do you think is still lacking um, so that, you know, these students are at par um, with students around the world? And um, I know for a fact, and if, if you look at the SAT scores, um, so there was a wonderful book called Price of Admissions. Um, and in that book, the statistics are very clear that 80% of um, students in Ivy Leagues would be um, South Asian or Chinese if that were only based on SAT scores or LSAT or GMAT scores. Um, and that is probably um, a very evident um, proof um, of uh, their intellectual capabilities. But then um, from a personal life perspective, um, how do you see the education system evolve in India? The, uh, it is changing, but it is not changing fast enough uh, to cater to the needs uh, of businesses today and even what is needed for success in life today. One aspect which is missing is practical application of skills. Uh, let's take the example of even data science, right? So there are, uh, if you look at even universities, there are they are launching their own courses uh, in uh, whether it is for uh, part-time professionals or even degree programs for graduates, undergraduates in, uh, in, in data science and AI. Uh, what is missing in these is a practical application aspect. Uh, you learn these models, but in what situations would you apply them? And how do you link it back to the purpose of a business? Those aspects and practical exposure is missing. Uh, that's one area I would mention. And second, going beyond the technical skills, how do you complement that with the life skills, whether it is communication or uh, in terms of uh, collaboration? Uh, recently, there was this uh, the Gartner CDO survey, which said that uh, it, it had a, it had polled all the chief data officers. Uh, this is the sixth annual chief data officer survey, and there the they had asked what are the top three skills for success of chief data, chief data officers, and what everyone has uh, said the strong factors are communication, uh, people related skills, and creativity and. Those are the skills which, uh, say, data leaders are calling out as crucial for their success. And the bottom three, surprisingly, had factors like uh, technical capability, domain knowledge, and some of those. It's not even middle, it is in the bottom. So when you have uh, industry leaders and people playing these uh, technical leadership roles saying that these are crucial soft skills, are we training the students in these areas? Perhaps we are not doing a good job. Uh, that is something I, I feel uh, educational institutions need to incorporate into the curriculum. And same is the case with even these uh, the uh, accelerator programs, given that a lot of uh, working professionals need, want to upskill into uh, fields like data science or could be other upcoming fields like, for instance, uh, virtual reality um, or, uh, or other, other, other developing revolutionary fields. In all of these, um, you need to bring in both these aspects I spoke about. One is a practical application, bring in an industry orientation. And for all of these revolutionary areas, in addition to technical skills, teach them life skills, communication, and, and how to collaborate and how to be a part of a winning team. I think that mix is needed. So, uh, I, but I see there are some interesting or promising developments. Uh, recently, I uh, joined the board of one of the institutions in Asia. Uh, the, they are coming up with their own program uh, for uh, ecological informatics. So they have onboarded a group of advisors from the industry and academia who uh, they expect to provide uh, practical insights on how the students can build a career and, and we are giving inputs on the curriculum. Uh, so that way curriculum design, uh, what should be the capstone internships? How do we make it more practical? So we are sharing inputs like that. I think uh, organizations, universities are bringing in uh, leaders and, and industry professionals uh, to complement and bridge those, uh, those those gaps which exist today. I think that is moving in the right direction, but we need to do it a lot uh, lot more and a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I think some, as someone who has worked in both academics and, and industry, I believe um, that um, there's a lot of unproductive um, and um, inte intellectualized um, domain um, knowledge in universities these days without any practical application. So when these people go to industry, you know, they don't know what to do. And um, I think Anand himself, you know, he just went for um, his engineering in IIT and then, you know, he went for an MBA in um, IM. And I think that's kind of, you know, bringing the best of the both worlds. And I was, I've been brooding about uh, what can be done so that, you know, people don't have to do multiple degrees 
in order to get the knowledge and that that would make them successful in both in careers and personal life. And one other thing that I've come up with, um, and you know, feel free to uh, pitch your um, ideas onto that, is that you know if we have more in the academic and industrial partnerships, where you know people you know spend um, considerable amount of time in each other's shoes to find out what the problems are, um, because one of the benefits of studying in a Scandinavian system is that, you know, they are pretty much ahead of every um, idea that um, Word is about to offer. So what we did in in MBA program is that they would just put us in um, CEO board meetings and, you know, understand their problems and strategy and how to fix them and go back to their research papers, bring ideas from the, there and, you know, see if that would actually work in real life. And that has taught at least me a lot about um, how to bridge these gaps. Um, what do you think some of the are some of the ways uh, that can help pave the way for um, this bridge to, um, you know, finally help people on the both side you know, see the other side of the town? Yeah. I think greater integration, uh, the example you mentioned, I, I see a lot of European and US universities doing that, not just uh, um, so where they don't restrict the internship to the final year or last semester. But if you can bring in students earlier, even when they are uh, early, early on in the course uh, and they're still uh, not clear about what kind of area where to specialize, if you uh, bring them into say the, the research labs or industry and give them some, some roles to play for a few months, uh, that will be a good blending of what they learned in the classroom with the, the practical exposure. And if you do it periodically through structured uh, programs and uh, like deeper hands-on exposure. That one will help them understand the industry side of things. Number two will help them make an informed choice on where they really want to uh, uh, specialize and where they want to build their careers and even whether the industry is relevant for them. Uh, and uh, vice versa, it uh, gives the industries. And, and second thing is uh, industries need to have, bring in academic uh, academicians and researchers from uh, universities uh, to understand what is the latest in academic research and see how they can incorporate it into their products and services. So this is the uh, bridging both, both these aspects. One is training the students and second, the industry benefiting from academia and bringing in those experienced people, the, the professors and, and uh, researchers uh, and learning from them. This is something for, as, as an example at Gramner, we have, uh, we, we routinely do that. Uh, for some of the engagements where we see that this is a very, very novel problem, particularly when it comes to AI and uh, there are some recent engagements. Uh, we are doing something with the pharma, with a pharma client um, where they for regulatory compliance, there is also anonymization in terms of uh, what is the data and uh, are you uh, disclosing the patient level details? So how do you, um, how are you able to use ML models to abstract it and make sure privacy needs are met? So this is, again, a fast uh, changing and an emerging area. So we have uh, been partnering with some university researchers who have published a lot of papers in this area. And we have learned a lot, which we don't see in the industry. A lot of practitioners don't have this knowledge. So that is an example of uh, industry learning from academia. And the other example I mentioned is in terms of students having it that uh, in pockets it's happening. Uh, we, we often encourage students to come into Gramner and do it like, uh, early on as well. We regularly carve out like structured or even little unstructured programs in different units of the business uh, where we partner with the with the different universities. I think that's a great initiative, uh, especially you know bringing out um, the point why AI adoption has been a problem for different um, organizations, and sometimes um, the in-house expertise is just not enough to cater to all pain points that that customer might have. Um, so one of the things that um, one of the articles I think that that's by McKenzie and talks about why organizations are reluctant in ado adopting um, AI initiatives. So some of the reasons are um, cybersecurity concerns, um, regulatory framework, explainability of the models itself. Um, I recently had a conversation with Serge Mice who published a book on uh, explainability with um, Python. And uh, then there's there are fairness issues, um, so you know to avoid lawsuits and things like this. And then we have um, cost involved with um, ROI. And I was just wondering, how do you actually address these issues um, at Gramner and you know in your consultancy practice when you talk to different um, organizations about um, how to um, answer these pain points for your clients? Yeah. Uh, 
if you're talking about uh, the common roadblocks, right? One is the the security and uh, the regulatory aspects. Organizations are worried what would be the downsides um, if there is a breach uh, in some confidentiality or data goes out. What happens, or if comp uh, or will they lose the competitive edge um, if they put put this out? Uh, when you uh, the way we have been trying to address this is one. There are some standard practices. Uh, industry standard practices and, and certifications, which uh, uh, whether it is our tool or our methodology, uh, we are certified in those and we, um, uh, we use that to uh, assure the clients that these are some standard practices which, which won't lead to a breach. And second is also the, the very element of trust. You can have the, the best of guidelines, but ultimately people, the team that is working on the job should follow it in spirit. So that's another thing which needs constant coaching and uh, you need to develop and build that trust uh, with your clients. Uh, I, I think it's a combination of uh, these two things which, uh, which will help. And uh, this is purely from a security and a regulatory compliance standpoint. Similarly, there are other roadblocks and other, uh, other things when you, um, in terms of what uh, inhibits leaders from investing in new technology. Uh, it could be the, the fear of backlash or uh, there are concerns around uh, fairness um, and whether your solutions that you put out, will it lead, will AI discriminate am amongst your customers? Uh, so there was this uh, the interesting study from, I think Stanford, which, uh, which found out that these, the personal assistants, Alexa, Siri, and all, most of them, they were not able to uh, detect, like when, when you talk about say, uh, people with uh, say black uh, pe uh, people versus white people, uh, particularly in the U.S., it was uh, uh, it was not able to understand uh, the, the the black people as much. There was I think it was thirty five percent error rate versus seventeen percent um, for the white people. So these kind of things are there which hold back uh, organizational leaders to say that okay, should I in, in, um, implement AI? Will it lead to a discrimination in my products and services? So I think all of these need attention and it is possible to solve, but uh, uh, it needs some custom approach and, and a human in the loop to make sure that it's not just a system which, uh, which can solve your problem, but a system assisted and enabling humans which can address the issue. I think one of the reasons why people are so afraid of um thinking about adopting AI wholeheartedly um, are the news um, like CNN, CNN Financial um, that were recently um, hacked um, and paid $40 million um, to get the data back. Um, and then FBI um, says that it has recovered the amount. Uh, but I guess that becomes a huge um, question mark for people. Um, you know, they kind of become divided into, okay, should we do that or should we not? But what they don't realize is that, you know, it's not about, it's not like that organizations were not hacked and blackmailed before AI actually came. Um, you know, yep. with technology, all these risks are yeah. always there. I mean, they could use some other way. I mean, um, then there are internal D factors. Um, so how do you personally um, tackle these um, issues when, when these questions are raised? I mean, do you have a specific strategy um, to you know, take these pain points one by one, um, or just give them some kind of. Uh, we talked earlier about the human baseline. You know, uh, well, it's at least better than what you currently have. So, uh, how do you do that? Uh, augmentation is a key. Uh, how you can um, assure customers by uh, talking about not just machines, but uh, machines plus humans coming together as a stronger force. Uh, like the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, that I very strongly believe in. And when, it, when uh, people talk about the fear or threats of AI, I always say that uh, AI is just a tool and you should be more worried about the humans behind the tool <laughs> because uh, that influences and that determines everything. If you can design these solutions to empower and enable humans, uh, and there are very specific ways and, and there's a structured methodology to, to do that, then you can uh, you can almost assure those outcomes. A few examples, right? How do you ensure augmentation? Number one, uh, find out, again, uh, we, we start with what are the objectives? How do we uh, have to solve the problems? And how are humans solving the problem today? And how we can enable humans to do it better? Uh, so that is the uh, real starting point where we 
look at um, you're talking about augmentation and different steps, right? So let's, uh, I'll give the first example of uh, increase in performance. Um, we will start with the establishing benchmarks. So if humans are at a certain level, when we bring in um, AI, we can show that it increases by a certain level. So that is uh, something which, uh, uh, which convinces people to invest in it. Second, when you look at resilience as a second factor, Machines can make mistakes. Machines regularly make mistakes. Uh, example is the, uh, the the pandemic. All the machine learning models they they blanked out last year, March April, because they have been trained on certain patterns of data, and uh, the pattern changed, and they were not able to predict. So in those situations, when you have machines and humans in the loop, they can kind of take over. Just like when you have those uh, the self driving cars and human assisted ones humans can take over uh, when they uh, they blank out. So that's the second case where you can bring in greater resilience when you have humans also assisting, uh, uh, assisting the models. The, the third and the final one is more in terms of fairness. So we talked about, I gave the example of um, these personal assistants discriminating against people. What is the best way to solve it? There's no ready solution today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, explainability and fairness uh, frameworks today, but none of them fully solve the problem. And the reason is uh, the models are not to be blamed for the underlying root cause, right? They're learning from the data. So our, uh, the human world is uh, full of biases. The models just mimic and they amplify it. So how do you control this? No amount of model engineering can make a model fair you will have to bring in humans and, and take those judgmental calls that, okay, in these scenarios, um, you need to blend in human decision-making with a model's results. So that's how you do it. Uh, so just to summarize, identify how you can augment or what is the benchmark and how you can augment it. Second, resilience by having humans in the loop. That's a strong use case for it. Third, fairness. Uh, when, you have, when you design humans into the system and you have a seamless handover uh, depending on scenarios, in some scenarios, you're comfortable 100% uh, of the decisions can be made by models. And in other scenarios, it does a, a smooth handover and humans take over, or it could be a hybrid with both. Interestingly, you know, there are ways to improve accuracy for the machine learning model, but there is no ways to improve the human performance beyond a certain level. So I think humans will always be, uh, you know, they're going to be bringing down the performance overall uh, with <laughs> augmented intelligence. But let's talk about uh, specifically about uh, actually, this. On that, on, the, on that note, uh, there's, there's just one example I can mention where uh, uh, models were pathetic and we brought in humans uh, to, to bridge that. Uh, so this was uh, for customer experience analytics. There was a case where uh, we were using language models, uh, uh, AI language models like BERT um, for classifying the text into different uh, customer journey steps. Uh, there, there were some journey steps or some, uh, some categories where there was not enough data available. So was, for some, we had like thousands of data points. Others, we had less than 100. So there's no way you can train a machine learning model for that. And specifically no way to train an AI model for that and do some simpler uh, uh, machine learning approaches. So in those cases, what we did was we uh, designed like, and those were the cases where the model accuracy was 50%, whereas uh, 80, 80 to 90% in other cases. So we designed the system such that in those, in, for those categories, uh, humans provide the, des uh, provide the input. And uh, when you combine both of these together, initially the model was around uh, 78% or so, because this 50% was pulling it down. And when those scenarios, humans came in and they uh, rated it at about 80% accuracy, the net accuracy of the model went up. So it's both ways. Humans, you're right, there are several biases, uh, which we can't seem to get over. At the same time, even in the future, with the best of AI models, there will be scenarios where it will fail. I think you're probably talking about this um, same uh, Forbes article um, that was about to mention about the customer service data and that you helped um, a large computer manufacturer, um, you know, um, right. use the augmented intelligence, which improved uh, their net promoter score. Um, I think uh, uh, the Bain & Company net promoter score is probably the industry-wide standard for um, right. how uh, the adoption will um, look like. And I think increasing human um, 
input when the data model seems to have you know peaked the performance is probably a very good match but how do you actually know because now i think it, the conversation is going more into the agi realm where you know uh, computers are very good at um, using their intelligence for a structured problem but for the unstructured problems the humans have to come in and see okay now this is how we have to mathematically model the instructions for the computer and this is the realm where you you cannot do that you simply have to use in, in human intelligence so where is this line between um and let's talk specifically about this case i mean what were the challenges you faced when you're working with this computer manufacturer in uh, finding out a right balance between human and machine intelligence to improve their net promoter score the challenge here the, uh, the customer was facing was uh, uh how to improve my net promoter score and additionally the bigger objective we talk about impact metrics right how can i bring in more revenue from my customers existing customers so that was a challenge uh, which was put out to us uh, we looked at different um, uh, sources of data how we how we can uh, approach this problem and use it to solve it uh, and we uh, settled on voice of customer survey so the customers running um, uh, regularly voc voice of customer service which had uh, quantitative data which has ratings on how happy are you on a scale of 1 to 10 um and uh, and that's how the the bain and company's nps score is also computed so when you have uh, they have a formula and which is industry standard this customer was using those nps scores and analyzing it in addition there were two columns one what are you happy about our services and uh, where do you think we should improve where customers used to write Uh, either a couple of sentences and there are other customers who write paragraphs of text <laughs> where people who are unhappy right? and that uh, text was largely ignored in the analysis uh, and that was like a, I, I, a, what what is called as a dark data a data which is available but untapped uh, so far when we looked at the data sets we saw that okay this is a gem which is waiting to be picked uh, so we said let's bring in some uh, text analytics nlp models and we will combine it with the uh with those which can process structured data so that's the approach we took and then um before we build the model we came up with the overall methodology okay what are the journey steps of the customers following and how do we tag these comments into those different journey steps um if a customer uh, for example writes that uh, imagine an amazon review right uh, the delivery was quick but the product is uh, terrible so that's a one sentence so language models can help you split that into different um, journey steps and based on the the strength of uh, strength and sentiment you can come up with scores so we went through all of that um, and then you can identify the topic what topic are they talking about is it product feature is it uh, something to do to, to do with the resilience of the product and so on uh, so we identified all of that and then the models were able to classify identify the sentiment and then we did final mapping of this which of these uh, feedback and journey steps are driving your customer satisfaction you have imagined seven steps from uh, discovery of the product to research uh, purchase onboarding customer service there are these are the typical journey steps in a in a customer's journey not all of these are equally important and companies don't have energy to spend on all of it yes there has to be a minimum acceptable level for all but if you have say uh, 10 million dollars to put into you can you cannot put into all these buckets you'll have to target some of these to take them to the really high level so with this analysis we are able to find out these are these two journey steps which are really influencing your nps others if you have a minimum acceptable level the customers are okay if you take that to a 90% level it doesn't really matter so it will be it's not going to really move up your needle so with that we were able to recommend saying any initiative you take to improve these two journey steps do that and these are some opportunities this is the feedback that the customer has so with this as a organization wide program and uh, we had uh, hundreds of thousands of responses from different customers uh, when we identified this and ran it over uh, a year we saw that this led to improvement in the nps score of by about 2 to 3 percentage 2 to 3 points which translated into 50 million dollar incremental revenue for the customer so that is the kind of impact metric and outcome we were able to achieve with this example and back to your question in terms of uh, identifying areas where humans and ai where do we use that uh, initially when we laid out the approach there was no thought of technology it was just what is needed to solve the problem 
and then when we evaluated the text we said okay let's uh, let's bring in uh, nlp natural language processing uh, and then at the next level when we looked at the volumes for each of these buckets we realized okay this models can handle uh, whereas these categories where the volume is less less than 100 you need humans to manually score and categorize these responses so that way it is uh, uh, you need to plan this as part of your solution approach design even before you uh, start building a model, your approach design will determine where you bring in humans and where you bring in AI. And during the model uh, building process, you will find out that the model fails in certain scenarios. That's a case where you go back to your design, change it, and uh, reassign the portfolios. So this is a continuous thing. And even when it, after your solution goes live, like COVID kind of situations, you will find out that you need to yet again go back to the drawing board and do some realignment to say, OK, in this situation, maybe or maybe the market has shifted uh, we need to give some of these or involve humans in these aspects ganesh one of the things that we both share um is um the love of nature um and you um like me have um, this exquisite taste in going into the wild and you know cut off for some while and you have uh, traveled uh, through himalayas and i think it's kind of tragic that you know um did Indian and Pakistani uh, Himalayas are separated by a line. I mean, it would mm -hmm. have been wonderful to actually go to the other side Absolutely. and enjoy that. Um, and you have been to Bhutan. Um, you had this fantastic experience that you have documented um, you're visiting a monastery um, in Bhutan. And just tell us a little about that. It, it's very scenic for me, at least. Sure. I, I would like to hear about some of your experiences also after this. Sure. Uh, so this one was... Uh, uh, so while I've been hiking um, in um, in the Himalayan region, different uh, uh, peaks, we've, we've been, uh, it's more like a three, four day hikes. Um, I've, I've been doing uh, hikes for treks. And uh, one, uh, I think it's about five, six years back, uh, I decided to take a, a two week break and I, I, I wanted to um, do some backpacking and I decided to do solo backpack, backpacking. Uh, and there was no plan. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll uh, set out. I'll uh, get started uh, closer to Darjeeling. And from there on for two weeks, absolutely no plan, no travel reservations. Uh, at the end of two weeks, I was, at the time I used to live in Hyderabad. So uh, back from um, the nearest airport to Hyderabad, I booked, those are the only two tickets I booked. Otherwise the entire two weeks were, were open. And uh, I didn't do any research in terms of where I want to go as well. I wanted to keep it completely exploratory. So for two weeks after landing there, um, I uh, went through uh, like emotions, a lot of emotions, sea of emotions uh, on um, how to spend the time and uh, how many uh, days to, uh, to spend in a particular uh, region and uh, where to live. I wanted to uh, talk to locals as much as possible and take in the, the natural scenery. So that way, uh, long story short, over the two weeks, I spent a um, good amount of time in uh, parts of Sikkim, uh, Darjeeling, Sikkim. And uh, I also went into Bhutan, uh, which was again not planned. And Bhutan uh, fortunately had a visa on entry. Um, and uh, uh, Nepal or Bhutan, I was thinking at that time, and I, I eventually landed up uh, in Bhutan. And Bhutan was breathtakingly beautiful. So there again, most of the places I went by foot and stayed in a lot of these uh, home shares so that I could chat with the local people. And uh, did a lot of uh, hiking. There's a tiger's nest in Bhutan, which is a very famous uh, monastery. Um, so it's, it's very scenic. Uh, so it was, I had a ball of time for the, the two weeks and solo traveling alone. And uh, there were a lot of anxieties and fears I had to conquer. Because uh, I remember very clearly the second day, I kind of was feeling very desolate. Like, <laughs> what am I even doing here? I don't know what to do. I don't know anyone around here. How am I going to survive uh, for two weeks? So, but eventually all of it worked out and that is one of the best trips I've had in life. Yeah, <laughs> I think I'm looking to do it again. I think uh, Himalayas, uh, people tend to be more welcoming and, um, you know, very peaceful and you, you can, yeah. you don't have to plan much because people generally, you know, help you out with any of your um, ideas in my own journeys into, um, you know, Kashmir and deep in the mountains um, mm -hmm. up in Gilgit, which is quite close mm -hmm. to, I think, the Indian um, Sikkim, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of lost the track of the map here. But um, how, how does it feel from an emotional perspective for someone who has 120,000 data points for every 15 minutes for the past four years? Wasn't it a little <laughs> intimidating not to have a plan? Uh, 
the it, it was a conscious choice that i wanted to um, challenge myself i think i i regularly do these experiments uh, to go out of the comfort zone uh, whether it is uh, uh, signing up for a completely unrelated skill and and, and trying to do trying to learn it or uh, some of these uh, 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 treks which are like uh, uh, i i've done some which are like uh, two days uh, and no sleep uh, like uh, very strenuous treks so some of these are to test my my own limits and to experiment some uh, experience and experiment with something new so from that perspective it falls into this other bucket of uh, uh, willingness to explore and have some adventure so uh, it's it's probably a curious balance of trying to document i think that's a very good observation that trying to document and plan everything on one hand and second thing is uh, uh, trying to take in uh, life the way it comes so uh, i think it's it's probably two different aspects but i i keep swinging between the sides Yeah, I guess that's kind of the balance between um, the nature and the nurture, and um, that's been a perennial debate. Um, but a um, good part of you is that you know you're using your analytical side to solve problems that are that are applicable to every one of us on a global scale. So you talked about um, the impact on the biodiversity and environment um, in your TED talk, uh, where you talk about um, the ways that rhinoceros and whale sharks um are being hunted um unscrupulously around the world and what can be done to prevent them let's talk a little bit about your um social initiatives and um your journey into um making environmental impact sure uh, a strong partner in this area has been microsoft ai for us uh, about 4 years back we started this partnership and uh, that was a time we were also uh, looking at biodiversity and uh, sustainability in some of these aspects and there were some public data sets uh, on kaggle uh, they had a lot lot of contests on identification of endangered species and so on so we were um, dabbling with that and around the same time this uh, uh, this partnership happened so along with microsoft we have uh, partnered with several ngos around the world uh, solving problems such as uh, counting the number of uh, penguins in antarctica uh, uh identifying elephants in africa from aerial footage so that you can um, you can protect them um uh, and uh, most recently the uh, high impact social and uh, even from a healthcare perspective is controlling uh, the mosquito borne diseases like dengue and controlling millions of deaths uh, which otherwise would happen so all of these are uh, projects some of these are pilots experiments um, to along with the ngos to try out what could happen uh, for example this, uh, penguins in antarctica was uh, was an experiment to find out can we really count penguins and zooniverse and uh, uh, oxford had set up this uh, these camera traps in in antarctica to take time lapse pictures of penguins through the day and they had data for multiple years everyone knows about the or at least everyone things there's a decline in penguin population with global warming and all but unless you prove it with hard facts it is very difficult to move policy decisions so that is where uh, the oxford university has been calling out for researchers and and people from the public to contribute and support with this process the model and the entire right from data labeling to model building process so we partnered with microsoft um, to build a, a a crowd counting model so in this case uh, crowds of penguins and uh, this had very good accuracy and it was able to find out what is the uh, whether it is a, a scarce uh, a sparse uh, picture or it's a very dense crowd it was able to identify penguins from there so uh, there are several such examples different classes of most of these are computer vision models and and there's one other uh, api like a species uh, detection api which we jointly build with microsoft that is public uh, and most of these models we have put out in the public or uh, they are as part of AP, they are apis uh, on the microsoft website so that one with uh, for thousands of species if you upload a picture it can tell you um, what animal and what subspecies it belongs to all of these are great for uh, uh, enthusiasts people who are uh, say animal lovers and uh, they are also important for influencing policy decisions that okay this is uh, the impact to for example whale sharks or to elephants or or rhinos and uh, there are some again ai driven solutions built by several people in the market to monitor and intervene the one of the example i cite in my tiktok uh, is about the 
uh, rhinos and how they're using drones, which are um, which bring in some AI capability to identify uh, presence of humans in that vicinity, and then it alerts the rangers, saying that there is human movement in this in this area, which is unusual, and it uh, directs the rangers to those spots so that they can reach there. And uh, even before a, uh, an attack happens, they can prevent it. So uh, one is detecting it. Second is sensing and finding out is there really a threat. And third is taking some corrective actions. So these are areas where AI has been using and we've been involved in different stages of the process. In some cases, it is uh, detection and uh, showing what is possible so that the NGOs can take some action. And in other, other cases, building the full solution and uh, working hand in hand and maintaining that. So the, the dengue example I mentioned, uh, that is with the World Mosquito Program, and um, that is also a Microsoft collaboration, where we built a solution which uh, can help control these mosquito-borne diseases. Um, can I just talk about, a little about, bit about uh, what lays ahead of uh, Gramner as a company? Because um, AI and data science is evolving really fast. Um, companies are coming up with their different models, you know, they're trying to them get a competitive edge by horizontally expanding their products to devour um, the startups um, or you know startups themselves probably are looking for um, a high priced exit. So Google Vertex um, AI has been um, announced like a couple of weeks ago um, and uh, there's a lot of buzz around that. It's an auto ML uh, process and it also teams up with uh, Trifecta to do some data processing before it actually works. It has decent uh, visualization and it can probably become one of the uh, competitors uh, for Gremner um, at some point. And I'm just wondering, how does Gremner plan to counter those um, competitors? And it's not only uh, Vertex AI, and you have Alteryx, you have K9, you have got H2O, and then you know there are other um, AutoML platforms. Um, so one of your edge um, that we have talked about is the uh, data stories and uh, storytelling component, which is um, a really strong one. But what else is out there for you to differentiate from these um, and try to you know seal tight your uh, growth? Uh, we are doing heavy domain uh, specific solutions. We are building a lot of these uh, verticalization and domain specific solutions. Um, and as part of Gramex, we are adding these as ready-made uh, solutions. We talked about the model libraries. We are also adding uh, the domain-specific use cases into the into the model gallery um, and, and overall into the platform gallery. Uh, that will further expedite uh, if organizations can find that there is a use case or a solution closer to what they have. Uh, that will even further uh, reduce their time to market. So domain verticalization is one area. Second is really integration with all of these tools. And as long as we can bring in the best of different worlds together into a single application, uh, that will also help. And a third one, which uh, we did uh, consciously two years back um, is we, in fact, Gramex is open source. So we put it out into the uh, public. And uh, at that point, about seven, eight years, we had been building uh, this as an in-house platform. And we made the bold decision to put it out on GitHub. So it is available as a public um, uh, platform today. And we are actively building a community around Gramex. So we want people to uh, realize the power of data-driven um, decision-making insights and storytelling. So uh, this is another way we are trying to um, ward off this competitive threats by creating this free platform with a lot of these modules around it. And uh, people, citizen data scientists can, can use it and um, um, we already are seeing thousands of people adopting it. Uh, this eventually will build uh, and it will create a momentum as to if it's uh, a very widely industry accepted platform which people can um, can tap into. Uh, this improves our relevance in the market. And uh, now when we have this open source platform, how do we uh, share it with our enterprise customers? Right. So we have a security module and some of those very specific features which enterprises need that we charge for. Uh, so that customers, if they want that module, they uh, they come to us. If they want just the uh, rest of the standard modules, then they can they might as well take it up and set it up on their own. Uh, so we are enabling and building that open source uh, the community around it. And in fact, in the longer run, we also want uh, people to take up the platform and build solutions by themselves with these strong integrations and with whatever investments they've already made. 
um, as long as, and we, uh, I mentioned about domain, we have gone very specific to four domains. So a combination of these things is what we, we believe will, uh, will keep us relevant in the future. Um, and uh, we also sp spoke about the advisory and the, the solutions which we built for specific customers who want further customization. Uh, we will continue to do those uh, the, the solutions and services part of the business. Hmm. Seems like a very judicious strategy, but I was just wondering if that, um, if you have put it already on the GitHub um, and you're serving as a platform, an integrative um, middleman between all the services like Tableau and Power BI um, and then Azure, um, AWS, where, where do you think that your monetization um, will come from if there is another company who starts you know just offering the same uh, platform especially and a lot of organizations are worried about the vendor lock-in and mm -hmm. um, these vendor lock-ins are coming from the company that you're integrating with for example power bi has, has its own um you know vendor lock-in tableau um, has its own offering but then you are there that you can build on top of that without vendor lock hands and you can take it out. So I was wondering what, what would the strategy look like for you? I mean, you briefly mentioned about the fact that you would certainly build upon your advisory um, services um, right. as well as your own platform. Um, and one other product that I was I wanted to talk about, um, which probably is one of the very uh, important selling points um, is your um, uh, PowerPoint uh, platform that you use, um, if I could get the name right, SlightSense, Slight Sense. which Slight probably Sense. Actually, uh, makes the data more uh, visually appealing right. and uh, helps with the data stories. So yeah. do you plan to use that as um, USB? I mean, how does it look like? Yeah, so that's a product we uh, launched uh, in the last year and we're, we're testing out the market and we're seeing good response. Um, so this is, uh, uh, what it does is it, uh, it, it is a bolt-on to, for instance, Power BI or to Tableau today. Uh, and it helps convert those visual dashboards into a PowerPoint format, uh, which you can further uh, edit and then distribute it within your organization. The pain point we saw uh, when we came up with the solution is a lot of organizations, when we observe how the users and analysts are using these uh, visualization platforms, visualization tools. So they uh, take screenshots, embedded into the into PowerPoint, and then they write some narratives around it, uh, text callouts, and then they uh, they build a flow, and then they circulate internally. Almost every organization, analysts are serving a set of end users or, or leaders with these visualizations. Um, and that that's a manual process involved. So we were testing it out by building slides and saying, okay, with this, it will connect to it, and it will extract it into uh, a PowerPoint format natively. And you will be able to edit and add those annotations within it. And if you, uh, we can integrate this with um, the source so that any changes you make, you will be able to reflect it back onto this, uh, the, the output module. And we are calling each of these as uh, bots, uh, each of these as bots, which create outputs in a certain template. So it's slightly different from what we spoke about earlier. This is uh, really the very last mile of delivery once you have insights on any, any of these popular tools, uh, how we can convert it and even enable automatic distribution. Or in some cases, if people have to do some quick edits, they can do that and then publish it. Uh, so that uh, we have some paying customers and uh, we are adding more features and more bots into it. Uh, so that's another, um, that, that's another offering which we are scaling up in parallel along with our platform plus services. Is it like um, you're giving them an option to download the PowerPoint or could it be the fact that there are multiple options like PDF um, and PPTX um, or even a um, web-based um, cloud uh, live presentation? I mean, maybe we can partner with um, SlideShare or what is that, Prezi? Um, and, you know, then you can have some integration that wouldn't even, that would cut down the um, step of downloading and then, you know, um, opening PowerPoint and things like that. Possibly. Currently, the use case we are uh, we are seeing, and when I mean, we did the, this market study, we found that a lot of a lot of organizations are distributing it on email internally, and mostly it is through PowerPoint. So that is the use case we are trying to address first. But eventually, you are right. Uh, there are other modes like on the cloud. You want to upload it, uh, say on Microsoft OneDrive or as a Google um, uh, Google PowerPoint or Google for Google presentation. Uh, those are other future cases where we can directly integrate into. 
and uh, like i mentioned this is uh, the first first set of use cases we are addressing and uh, we are uh, interestingly we are seeing um, a lot of different uh, kinds of feedback and there is demand which we are seeing so uh, many of these we will add it as part of the product roadmap it's kind of interesting that you know it's it's easier um to explain the business use cases um in the uh, white papers to decision makers but i wish that was as easy to explain um to children and you talk about your attempt to explain deep learning to your daughter um and <laughs> how did it actually go and uh, what were the challenges yeah uh so i take this upon myself as a challenge that if i can explain something without jargons in simple english then i really know about it um so uh, if you're familiar with feynman um so there's a popular quote attributed to him that if you can't something if you can't explain something simple enough you really don't understand it uh, so that be the the challenges uh, with my uh, son and daughter who are in elementary school uh, i regularly try to explain some of the step one is part of their uh, uh, education of what the world is around <laughs> world around them is like and second is my own uh, experimentation i'm using them as um, uh, say pilots to test it out and say do they really understand often i convert it uh, into some uh, i usually tell bedtime stories uh, to my kids and that's one favorite time uh, favorite time slot in the day for me and the kids look forward to it, to it as well so that is the time where i try and uh, bring these in as anecdotes and i say okay how does for instance we have uh, google home how does it work and uh, if you have photos on your phone and it is automatically identifying people uh, so i explain how it works so that way uh, that is something which uh, uh, i continuously experiment uh, and uh, try to demystify them the the interesting side effect there is the same explanations often when you use it with business folks in organizations in the professional context they work well because if you can explain it to kids then almost everyone else can understand and uh, uh, yeah so so that that's a good parallel seems like it went well uh, let's connect it with a trend that's uh, gotten really big in india at least and and you know um, a lot of people are calling it scam also with the white hat um junior um you know teaching five years old how to program and you know building a hype right. around the data science and artificial intelligence and i don't know um you know if you're familiar with that but where do you stand on the spectrum yeah uh, see i think the challenge there was this uh over promising and uh raising the expectations uh, i've seen some of those promotions i've not done a uh, detailed research on that but uh, what i understand Uh, from the promotions and then the major disconnect was uh, they were promising um say uh, six figure salaries in the silicon valley and they're saying uh, learn this and you will get that and uh, some of it was uh, uh, again you're talking about five or six year olds uh, uh, the intent uh, yes how you lucky have you outcomes. been you know you know ha- had you seen those advertisements when you were young you would have yeah. saved your, yourself a <laughs> lot of work <laughs> <laughs> like in in fact a lot of, uh, of funny posts on linkedin where uh, industry leaders say that okay i don't earn this much and i, I don't know <laughs> i have so many years of experience working in data science what are you promising <laughs> so i think uh, the major challenge was with the dis- with the uh, over promising and uh, unrealistic expectations and again uh, taking this uh, education and um, uh, education aspect too far yes you want to talk about eventual job security or in terms of uh, outcomes career outcomes but you don't uh, when you start harping on it too much probably it, it creates a, a disconnect i think that probably was a thing but otherwise um, my thought on teaching kids these the new technologies or whether it is coding i strongly am for it so uh, you'll have to check the the child's interest as well so uh, you don't force it upon them but otherwise uh, it's always good for kids to get an early introduction to technology and understand what is really happening behind the scenes i'll give you an example why this is important uh, i have seen my son and daughter uh, they talk to google uh, like they have conversations with google home at uh, we have it in our place so they have conversations as if it were an individual um, so what do you like and uh, so that actually uh, was alarming to me because when kids don't understand what is happening behind the scenes and they treat it like an individual uh, if they imagine it to be a friend and start sharing their uh, uh, like their secrets 
or uh, they they don't uh, they don't know that actually actually this is part of the internet and there could be other uh, parties monitoring it and there are attacks possible so that is where you take technology too far and place too much of trust and the same challenge is not just with kids with adults as well so that i want to avoid so which is where educating kids about what this really is so for example in this case i said this is nothing more than a browser tab in your computer now everyone like kids are using zoom right so this is nothing more than a browser tab on your computer just that it is talking out that line that you see on your browser uh, search google search results so this is not an individual don't have these kind of conversations and this is how it actually works i also give an example of this is kind of a library of libraries it has no intelligence it just aggregates information so when you start uh, explaining and putting things into context kids will be able to understand and this same thing applies to uh, educating adults about ai right so yes be excited about the technology but don't place too much of trust in it and you also need to be aware aware of the negative consequences watch out and do take up activism when things are going wrong do you think that you know we have lived in a very different world than our um, children in aspects um that are not even fathomable um these days for example we used to have this like you know man to man conversation with each other you used to travel through relatives in each you know we could go in without um our mobiles and our phones for quite some time um and you know there, there were interpersonal connections but you know, children these days they build connections using those devices and it's kind of hard for them to uh maybe sometime you know we play this prank in the house you know you just turn off the wifi and see you know how people need to react you know and not right. all of those reactions are very civilized but you know that kind of drives the point home that um people are gotten so used to it and especially with the children uh, do you do you see it is a good trend or do you see it as a part of change or do you, do you think there can be a problem also there are opportunities and challenges as long as we draw the line and um uh, and set a limit to these online interactions the way at least i'm uh, uh, we manage it at home with my uh, with our kids so my wife and i uh, we very consciously plan this that there is um, a limit to the screen time and there's a limit to these kind of interactions my my son uh, has been i started playing um, minecraft and he was um, earlier was with roblox so that way these uh, the group gaming and uh, connecting with other kids online through these uh, through, through these channels i think it is needed they need to understand the world because in the future a lot of these things uh, whether we like it or not a world will be run like this a lot of virtual interactions will happen so we don't want them to go cold into that world and not be prepared for it but at the same time appreciating the value of these personal interaction interactions like what we have had uh, like back then as kids right when we grew up so that we want the kids to go through as well so if we can uh, set limits and say okay this is uh, how much time you spend and this is how much you uh, you do on uh, these apps or computers versus uh, how much time you spent physically connecting with kids and and going out and playing out in the open so if as long as we are able to balance both of it and show the value i think they will uh, they will have a well rounded personality um very few people know that about you um but uh what they do need to know about you is that minecraft was not your favorite game when you were a child um that was chess and <laughs> i was uh, wondering you you have played on a uh, quite um senior level um both in your school and in university your sister was a um champion of the uh, regional level and i was just wondering um how did you actually get into that tell us a little bit about your um i mean if you weren't a um ai leader and you had the opportunity to become the professional uh, chess player um would the world be a little different for you absolutely the chess started off as a, a early interest and it was uh, it was an accidental discovery um uh, so my start my sister started playing chess uh, there were some classes at school that's how she started and my uh, our father used to teach uh, us um at that time i wasn't serious i was about 7 years old or so i was just basically tagging along wherever my sister was participating in competitions um uh, so my sister was uh, very studious and she uh, she went through that and she won the district level competition and she was qualified for for, for the state level at that time um, um in india um, the the state i lived in was one of the strongest uh, uh, states and there was it was very competitive and this was the time of uh, 
when Vishwanandan Anand, uh, before he became the world champion. So he was a grandmaster in the 80s right then. And uh, he was a big inspiration for all of us. So he had just become grandmaster and we were all, uh, we were all just beginning our chess journey. Uh, so at that time, uh, the, this state uh, tournament my sister participated in, uh, until then I had not uh, uh, won any tournament, leave alone be competitive about it. Um, so I used to just go along and, and there, there weren't these age category tournaments. It was mostly say senior, which was under 15 or so. Uh, so I was seven, eight years old at that time playing. Uh, so this state level competition is the first one, which was under 10. Um, and I uh, participated in that one just because my sister was playing in a higher level one and I couldn't be left at home. So my parents enrolled me in this one. Uh, and to everyone's surprise, uh, I ended up winning that uh, state championship. <laughs> so I came second. And, uh, and unfortunately, my sister lost that one. She was a district champion. She lost that one. So that was the, that is how my chess journey started, um, the real serious chess journey. And uh, for about seven years, chess was the number one priority. Education was number two. So I was uh, training with coaches, traveling all over the country, playing. And there was a few days I was used to be in school. So that way, chess was, uh, I really loved chess. And chess was a very serious uh, thing in my life at that point. Uh, just that very abruptly when I came to those the high school and we had to make a decision like the public board exams and there was a decision okay can I continue to spend as much time uh, on on chess um, so a, a typical decision at that time a safe decision was education over sports so uh, my chess uh, career also was sacrificed at that point um, I, I didn't have an opinion so I, I didn't really put up a fight as well so I went with the decision uh, but that's how it came to an end but uh, those I think about seven years of uh, going really deep into chess and being in fully immersed in the game. Uh, I still retain that line of thinking, um, whether it is uh, say the, uh, calculating moves ahead or looking at it from another person's uh, point of view. So I played many national level tournaments, and uh, uh, so, so that was that was good. And you, you, uh, maybe if I'm not into this field, and if perhaps I had continued in that uh, career path, I would have still been very happy. Well, the other decision turned out pretty well. Also, I'm just wondering, um, are you familiar with the um, AI, um, IBM's um, AI um, chess bot, Deep Blue, is, uh, yeah. beat um, Kaspersky the first time? And I'm just wondering if there is a parallel between um, chess and, and IQ, because if that were the case, you know, a lot of these people would have, uh, you know, made huge strides in, um, let's say, stock markets or um, other areas where, um, you know, they could have earned a lot more money than simply chess, or maybe it's just a labor of love. What do you, what do you think? Is it more transferable to um, other fields, um, or really is, um, you know, finding the best moves um, on a limited board? Yeah. Uh, it's a question of uh, the uh, uncertainty as well. So uh, the, the pat AI and uh, this is it, it, AI is really good at pattern spotting and matching this uh, within chess or for that matter the game of Go, which a few years back uh, the AI won the world champion um, again from Deep Mind, right? Uh, so these are games where there is again uh, this narrow intelligence uh, within the, the narrow spaces. AI has mastered it and it can. Um, it can teach newer versions of AI now, uh, which can quickly master another narrow area. So that's where AI is very good at today. Whereas when you talk about the stock markets or any of these other areas, uh, it is much broader. And when you talk about IQ, AI still doesn't have common sense. It is It has narrow intelligence, but it doesn't have common sense, simple common sense. That's uh, a territory which is yet to be breached. It, it will happen in some time, but I think it's not there at that level. And artificial general intelligence, uh, which can bring in that capability, there are estimates. Experts say uh, the optimistic estimates are 10 to 15 years, whereas the pessimistic ones, people say 50, 60 years, or it might take a lot longer than that. Uh, I think it probably is, is going to take a lot more time, not just 10 years. And until then, this narrow intelligence is good enough. If you're looking at augmentation and helping us do uh, our jobs better and improve our lives. We really don't need to go on that never ending search for artificial general intelligence. I think narrow intelligence serves our purpose uh, very well today. Mm. I think it's not all um, in a better world when it comes to um, AI solutions. You talked uh, in one of your um, articles about um, 
I think I hope that I remember the name right. Elaine Hersberg who was got who run uh, got run over by Tesla, okay. um, because you know it, the model wasn't trained for someone who's walking in between the road. You know, yeah. it, it's it's trained on jaywalkers and cross walkers, right. but not the ones. So do you also see um, a threat that's emerging um, from our um, increasing artificial um, intelligence? And like you rightly pointed out, that it simply doesn't have common sense. You know, it's only doing what you're you know, teaching them through a structured mathematical model. Yeah, uh, that uh, threat is very much uh, there when you mindlessly apply AI to areas uh, just because it is performing well in, in one area. Uh, goes back to the, uh, the point I mentioned earlier, don't be worried about the AI, but be worried about the human behind the AI. So the area of application and how it is applied and in cases, if you apply it without a human in the loop or without a human support, that can be dangerous. So it's not the, the danger of the technology in itself, but um, poor design and lack of human augmentation. Um, one of the hottest debate um, in the circles uh, in AI now seems to be between the US and China, you know, and things are getting really hot now. Um, with Biden trying to um, meet with the um, G7 uh, presidents um, and decision makers to impose more tariffs on China, or at least try to make it um, harder for them to, you know, gain more um, ground when it comes to the techno technological landscape. China has recently um, sent um, a satellite um, into the space with, um, which is promising six G. Um, technology and it's pretty much covered with 5G um, itself in China and it's not yet there in US uh, ubiquitously. Um, so in many ways China is beating US both in publication, if you look at the newer, newer IPS um, conference presentations and academic output, China is way ahead of uh, US and that is, has, um, that is quite alarming to the US, which has frankly has never uh, played a fair game when it comes to world politics. So <laughs> where do you stand on that? How do you see the developments? And you certainly have um, a lot of interaction with um, Asian um, countries and clients. Um, how do you see that and develop? Yeah, the, the progress by China, uh, whether it is research or adoption in mainstream, that's, that's undeniable and unstoppable. Uh, it, it's really rapid. Uh, I think there is uh, the uh, this kind of comparison and uh, war of words uh, amongst countries. I am not an expert in that area. I don't know enough about it to comment. Uh, but my only point here would be how we can bring in collaboration so far, whether it is internet or the progress we have seen with uh, these revolutionary technologies, not just AI, but anything else is through uh, collaboration across borders. If this turns into a fight as opposed to uh, something which we do together, like at least researchers do together across uh, journeys and, and building upon one another's work, uh, it can get counterproductive and harmful uh, in the longer run. Uh, in fact, uh, there was uh, uh, this quote by uh, Tom uh, Thomas Malone, a professor at MIT. Um, I, had, I had an interview with him for one of my articles. So he also mentioned uh, that uh, if you look back at history, the progress and innovation has happened not just by individuals, brilliant individuals doing it on their own, but by collective progress. We had, if you look at 500, 600 years, 600 years back, there were some uh, geniuses who were doing a lot of uh, stuff independently, like a lot of hundreds of patents and so on. But in the last 500 years, uh, the progress humanity has made is largely through collective work and by riding on one other's uh, steps, like progress in different areas. Uh, my only worry is with these kind of comparisons and, and this kind of a war, trade war or innovation war, uh, it can impact collaboration. As long as uh, we as practitioners can watch out for that, that will be good. I think it, it's not completely within the control. It has to happen at the governmental level as well. So that is my only thought, how can we avoid it? And I think there's still um, a huge codependency between two countries with the Apple manufacturing happening in um, China right. and so vice yeah. versa. China is still ahead um, in trade deficit um, with $250 trillion. I think that was the last um, number. But let's talk about one of the uh, promising solution that's coming out um, of AI, which has huge promises for large scale production. Um, which is smart twins and companies have um, started to look into that. You know, a lot of automobile companies in Germany 
are trying to see how it can uh, impact their production, uh, minimize their cost. And um, Gramex being a platform um, certainly um, is in keeping with the latest development. How do you think there's an opportunity for Gramex to tap that market? That's a great question. Um, digital twins is uh, a rising trend and uh, I don't think it is just a buzzword. Uh, there is strong potential for it. Uh, the simple reason we have re a simple reason is we have enough data, enough uh, digital footprint for most of the entities, um, whether it is processes in the organization or machinery or uh, even actions taken by people. Uh, you have sufficient history, sufficient granularity, and all of it is also being uh, automatically collected. When you have this kind of a digital trail, you can easily replicate an entity. I imagine there is a, a manufacturing process and uh, you have raw material going in at a particular, uh, say, temperature, humidity, and certain, uh, certain conditions. And then the, the machine works on it and then creates your output. So you have all of the uh, uh, digital footprint around this from input process to output. And you can virtually create a replica of this machine, which is actually what, is a, what a digital twin is. And uh, with this, you can start monitoring and without even actually inspecting the physical thing, you can, you can tell by looking at this digital model that okay, this is working fine. And now if you extend this further, uh, how will it happen? How will the production be impacted tomorrow? Let us say your temperature is likely to drop unusually low. If you change that parameter and say, how will it in, impact my manufacturing process? You put it into the digital twin and find out what will be the quality of the raw material tomorrow. If you can make that kind of predictions, then you can plan for this change and uh, you can tweak your machine parameters or whatever is needed in the process to ensure good quality. So this is an example of why digital twins are relevant and how they can be used uh, along with data science in terms of this prediction aspect and, and collecting all of it. Now, uh, Gramex, uh, I mentioned that it is a low code platform which helps uh, build those solutions, um, custom solutions. We have uh, seen a great fitment of Gramex capabilities in terms of building these kind of digital twin solutions because digital twin solutions ultimately are an extension of the actual thing. Just that you fit in these, uh, the, the historical data, the machine learning aspects, and you show it with a rich storytelling layer. So that way all of these primary components of Gramex are ready to uh, create a digital uh, twin replica. There's one conversation we're having with a logistics uh, company in the US. Um, the logistics player, uh, logistics player which is looking at uh, their warehouses and how to optimize operations within the warehouse. Now, if you build a digital twin of this entire warehouse, all of the people coming in, moving the goods, and uh, when customers come to drop off stuff, pick up the stuff, and how the, the people move in and handle those goods. So you have digital footprint for all of these things. Now, if you build a replica, a digital twin of the entire warehouse, uh, people sitting in the headquarters can monitor it and, and find out how is it going? What are the potential choke points which will come in the future? and take some collective action so that they, they notify the, the warehouse workers and ask them to make some, some corrections. Uh, so this is something which we are conceptualizing and trying to build it using Gramex. And there are several other cases. There are some examples on our website where we have done some of these in other industries. It certainly seems like um, an area that um, you can innovate in uh, based on your current innovations with, you know, the end to end uh, platform solution with data and transformations, uh, modeling, and then um, creating data stories. And, you know, if you could, and these are the things that you are already using the digital end to end situation where you have to finally report um, the business intelligence to the decision maker. Um, and I guess the only component that you would need to design um, is the whole replication and you know how the actors Correct. act within that uh, probably a little bit of reinforcement learning um, would be needed in there also to find the optimal uh, solution in the moment now um, yep. Ganesh what a wonderful conversation that has been uh, we have talked from um, from data to the trends, uh, the uh, lacking areas, um, your trips to Himalayas, and I wish <laughs> uh, we could have more time to do that. But thank you so much for uh, being with us. It's, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. My pleasure, uh, Minaj. It was, it was a great conversation, and it's probably uh, this was a record for the longest uh, podcast or interview I've been on. Uh, but it didn't feel like two hours. I think it was a very, very smooth, natural conversation and the, the kind of uh, topics you brought in 
contemporary issues to uh, stuff like uh, education and uh, things to do with kids beyond the work stuff it was it was a very uh, enjoyable conversation thank you again for the invite you're welcome and uh, hopefully we'll um, you know join in a trip to himalayas together next time we see each other <laughs> absolutely <laughs> given the common interest i would would love to yeah. oh sure there is <laughs> thank you so much <laughs>